Konbanwa. Good evening. That's what we say in Japanese. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Those who are waiting, please come and uh, join and take seats. You'll be very comfortable very soon. No problems. I think the welcome that I'm going to extend to you is literally warm, not just in terms of sentiments, but with 46 degrees centigrade outside. <laughs> I think even the Mitsubishi air conditioning might not be able to handle this Ahmedabad heat. <laughs> of course, I know they are tough sumos and they can do anything. Minasan, let's welcome amidst a warm round of applause our distinguished chief guest, <laughs> Mr. Aisuke Shiozaki, the managing director and chairman of the Mitsubishi Corporation, India Private Limited. And it is a very special evening for us today because AMA, its Japan Center, and the Indo-Japan Friendship Association have had a very special relationship that we have shared over the years with Mitsubishi Corporation India. As you know, what came to be acknowledged as one of the country's first and finest Japan centers, which showcases Japan in India, we were very proud that the AMA's Japan Information and Study Center came to be acknowledged. But then, this would not have been possible, as we all know, but for the very large-hearted and magnificent support that came to be extended to us by Mitsubishi Corporation India and its wholly owned subsidiary, Metal One India Corporation, way back in 2015. In fact, it was almost four years ago in 2000. 14, a little after this time when the interactions between Mitsubishi and uh, AMA started and uh, which culminated into this very monumental experience of setting up the Japan Center of which we are so proud of. I'm very happy on behalf of the Ahmedabad Management Association and the Indo-Japan Friendship Association to welcome Mr. Sh Shiozaki, along with his colleagues who have also come from Delhi, Mr. Ando and Mr. Chopra from Kolkata, uh, all very senior leaders of Mitsubishi, on their first official visit to AMA and the Japan Center. Thank you very much, sir, for coming and being with us this evening. And as you will see, he is a very fine and articulate speaker and he's going to share some wonderful thoughts on a very absorbing subject of experiences of Japanese entities in India. Some points to ponder. Well, Gujarat has been the focus of uh, Japanese business in India for quite some time. And I think it's very appropriate that we have uh, Shiozaki-san talk to us on this very, very important subject. Friends, uh, Shiozaki-san, if I have to introduce him, he started his career with Mitsubishi way back in the mid-80s, in 1985. And thereafter, he has actually been traveling globally. He's been in the United States, he's been in Europe. He's, uh, of course, been there in Japan in very key positions. And now, apart from Heading India, he also holds a very prestigious position of being the senior vice president of Mitsubishi Global and uh, has held several important positions for the entire Southeast Asia as well. So I'm sure he's sharing with you this evening his thoughts 
on uh, Japanese experiences in India. Of course, he's been here for just about around a year, but I believe that's more than enough for him to be able to give a lot of insights. And uh, I do not wish to take much time except for the fact that it's always heartening to see that, sir, even on a hot summer evening, uh, when people would not want to get out of their houses or go straight from offices to their home, we have such a fine audience uh, that speaks volumes for the fact that uh, we love Japan and uh, people have high regard and respect for Mitsubishi and obviously its captain as well. So friends, on behalf of uh, all of us, may I take this opportunity of requesting the president of the Ahmedabad Management Association, Mr. Rajiv Mehta, to please present a memento to uh, Shiozaki-san. And uh, we, want to <coughs> we want to do the honors because this truly symbolizes, sir, Ahmedabad in all its respects. I would take this opportunity of presenting flowers which always, you know, say the best language in terms of our affection and feelings to each other. We are also very happy to have the business head of Mitsubishi, uh, Mr. Ando, here. And uh, may I request uh, the Vice President of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association, uh, Malti Ben Mehta, to please welcome Ando-san uh, with a very traditional handicraft of Gujarat, of the celebrated uh, Toran of Vardnagar, as we call it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we're also very happy that from Kolkata, we're having Mr. Rohit Chopra, who is the head of CSR projects of Mitsubishi in India. He's also here. We would like to extend him a very traditional welcome. And may I request uh, Mr. Sandeep Shah, the treasurer of the Indo-Japan Friendship Association, to please present this to Mr. Chopra. And as a small uh, memory of our uh, Japan Center's visit, we would like to present something which you would like to take home. And uh, seeing that, you will remember our ukiyo-e paintings that we have so proudly displayed in the center. And I would request uh, uh, our graphic artist and designer, who in his rightful position is also the Honorary Joint Secretary of our Association, Mr. Nilesh Dave, to present this uh, graphic uh, ties design to Shiozaki san. <laughs> okay, <laughs> lovely. And uh, may I also request Dr. Mukun Patel, our Chief Information Officer, to present uh, uh, this ukiyo-e design to Ando san, please. Uh, yes, uh, I think we'll give him something different to carry. <laughs> so please uh, take this with us. Thank you. And uh, may I invite our Japanese language teacher, Ms. Dipti Chitale, to please come here quickly. And Dipti will present uh, this to Shiozaki san. Mm -hmm. With, of course, a uh, greeting in Japanese as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> well, friends, it's time that I request uh, Shiozaki-san to speak. But before that, I wish to acknowledge something which I feel the entire Ahmedabad and Gujarat should feel proud of. 
Well, before 10 years, I have friends like Mr. Ashish Soparkar, I can name him because he's a leading eminent uh, businessman and industrialist here. And if I were to ask him that, could you imagine that in Ahmedabad, 10 years ago, if we had a Japanese uh, business tycoon like uh, Mr. Shiozaki, and uh, we were to have a dozen youngsters, uh, eminent, uh, you know, businessmen, professionals, working executives in their own right, join for an evening session and have 45 minutes of chaste Japanese interaction. I think uh, you would say, you must be joking, Mukesh Patel. And as a matter of fact, this would not have been possible. But today, it did happen. And in fact, we're very proud because after the similar experience Madam Aki Abe got when she interacted with our Japanese language students and she was so happy she even sang a song. You have to sing a song finally with them <laughs> before we depart. May I request our Japanese language students who interacted with him and who are sitting in the hall, just please stand up. Just stand up for a second. Yes, you are. And uh, I'm going to ask you something extempore, right? I'd like you to sing two lines of a Japanese song, Anona, in honor of welcoming uh, Mr. Shiozaki and his team from Mitsubishi. Would you like to do that instantly? Just decide <laughs> what, what words you want to catch up and do it. And then, then I'll give the stage to him. Or if not collectively, a few of you can, right? Good, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much. And it's time we all give a round of applause as I invite Mr. Shiozaki to speak this evening. Thank you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ano, and thank you for uh, Mr. Patel, Mr. Mehta. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. The, I haven't learned any Hindu songs yet. The <laughs> only thing I can sing is, I know, Jama Kana, Nandakana. <laughs> you know the national anthem, Jana Kama, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm just trying to learn at the moment. So uh, give me a little more time and the next time I'll sing the whole national anthem for you. Ne? All right, well, thank you so much for uh, uh, taking this opportunity. Uh, today, uh, what I would like to talk about is uh, exactly the experiences of Japanese uh, companies in India. But as he confessed, I've been only here for one year. And you know one year is not enough to learn India. There's no way. But uh, let me just share with you what I have so far kind of felt about what is uh, the, what is the issues between Japan, Japanese companies being successful in India and what are the changes that's happening? Um, and I'm going to try to go through it, but there's a lot of words I think you, it's going to be too small to read. Uh, just get the flavor of it, that the details are not going to be so important, okay? So. The things I'm going to talk about is, I'm just, just going to go briefly, five minutes, about introducing myself and Mitsubishi. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, Japanese companies in India, but I'm going to look, on, look into the history and, uh, and see what, what's the lesson learned from this. I'm going to go into my basically talking about the remaining of the time. I'm just going to talk about really three things. One is tactics, and one is culture, the company culture, and the, uh, the la finally, the uh, mindset. So those are the only three things that I like to just refer to tonight. 
All right, just my profile, as he mentioned briefly, I was born in 62 and went to New York when uh, John, John F. Kennedy died. I don't remember a thing, but uh, back then, New York, uh, according to my father, uh, was uh, not a very good place to live. I mean, it was still a lot of crimes and so forth, and I think a lot of things have changed since then. I went back to Japan, uh, Japan, then I returned to Chicago in 72, and America was going back now. It's, it was gaining the momentum. It was a bicent uh, bicentennial uh, days, and so that it was uh, celebrating 200 years of the birth. Now, 200 years of birth, I mean, India and Japan, man, we're like 2,000 or 3,000 or whatever, but anyway. Joined Mitsubishi in 85, and I had my first assignment in New York in, from 89 to 95 during the Gulf War days. Uh, I was in the island in the Caribbean, so I was watching the TV uh, when the people are fighting the war, and that was very strange days. I returned back to Japan and went to uh, 99 to Düsseldorf, Germany. And um, of course, I didn't see the World Trade Center, but uh, the news came and it was a huge shock, uh, as everyone must know. Returned back to Japan and now, uh, since last year, I've been in New York. So I think I know a little bit about uh, cross-culture. But as for Mitsubishi is concerned, I think they know, or Mitsubishi knows, so cross-culture. We work uh, in around 90 countries and uh, we have offices, about 200 offices around the world. And I think we do this cross-culturing and um, uh, interactions everywhere in the world at the moment. And I think that's our bread and butter for the time being. Mitsubishi in India. Um, as you know, Mitsubishi handles uh, from, um, uh, let's say, uh, automobiles to uh, LNG, or lo lots of things, but few things which we do in Mitsubishi that I'd like to just mention, we will be starting our uh, imports of LNG to uh, India uh, from uh, possibly the end of this year to next year. We have a, a joint venture with Isuzu in making Isuzu cars. Anyone riding Isuzu here? No, okay. <laughs> Only Mitsubishi cars, ne? Okay, Ma, next time go around, look for Isuzu, please. What about uh, cup noodle? I know, have you gone to uh, Indigo Jet, you know? Yeah? yeah? Ne? All right, Ma, this is uh, what we do in joint venture. So these are the activities we have in India. So this is just the introduction. I'm gonna get into the, uh, the uh, discussion about the Japanese entities in India and uh, how I see it for the time being. I'm gonna look into the history, but don't, like I said, it's going to be in fine print, so don't look at the too, in too much in details. But India, from a historical point of view, I see just in two pages. One from the independence to 91, and it's 91 onward. So it's going to be just two pages. And um, I don't, I'm not sure whether this is a def, uh, correct definition, but that's how I interpret it. These are the things that happened during the, uh, um, uh, from the independence to the um, uh, 91. And um, I'm not gonna go into de uh, the details. This line is uh, uh, accumulation of the GDP, uh, which just slowly, slowly evaluated back in those days. Here's the picture which I like you to watch, but names are not important. I've listed the successful foreign companies who are succeeding in India, uh, the companies who have published the numbers so that I can track down, and listed the names and plotted where they have when they have entered India. As maybe you can see that this first part, and the most, as you may know, the most successful foreign company is in India is Unilever by, by far margin. <coughs> and there's Colgate's, there's Nestle's, um, Cummings, Siemens. These companies 
were here before the independence or just right after the independence. And they've been doing the Make in India for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Whereas you don't see one single Japanese company, I mean, maybe small companies, I'm not talking about small ones, but I'm talking about major companies. You won't see one single Japanese company except Marty Suzuki. And this came in 1981. 1981 is an year where India financed from IMF. And from the Japanese company point of view, there was no way in the world that we would go into India and do a make in India at that time of the period of time. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't, I was still a student back then, but I'm sure that if I was in the corporation that there's not gonna be any chance of going to India when IMF is still financing. Suzuki did it and it paid off. And this is not the story that I'm gonna tell you today. I think everyone knows about uh, Marty Suzuki's old stories. But all I'm saying is that when you plot it, there's only one single company from Japan in this period of time. Now, the next page is from 1990 onwards. And a lot of things happened, but this plotted uh, line is the GDP, which obviously the numbers are not important, but you see the uh, sharp ray rise in the GDP. We better start recognizing this country is I think the atmosphere that has created uh, even within Japan. However, as you may be able to see, real entrance of Japanese companies into India comes in around in mid 90s. So companies like Honda, Canon, uh, companies like Daikin, these companies have entered India in the mid 90s. Samsung, Hyundai, big, big winners in, uh, in India. They're also in the mid 90s. And you're trying to figure out why. And I guess my answer is that all the attention of the Japanese companies in the early 90s and 80s to early 90s were focused in China. Japan, Japanese company focused in China and didn't have the resources to come to India. I think Hyundai and Samsung, maybe I'm wrong, but they were struggling to enter China and maybe that's the motivation to come to India much quickly than the Japanese did. But anyway, having said that, um, Mitsubishi at the below, um, we also made uh, several investments uh, in India in mid 90s. Uh, we had some shares in Mahindra Mahindra, which we gave up. If we still have it, we don't even have to work now, I think, you know, I mean, <laughs> with the stock market price. So I think there's a lot of lesson learned from that. But anyway, the mid 90s was the first wave of the Japanese companies entering to India. Now, the second wave comes in around 2005-ish. Uh, maybe you haven't heard about Yakurto. I don't know. Yeah, the drink, the little, yes. Yakurto is from 2005, Panasonic, Unicharm, Nikon. Those are the uh, companies, Japanese companies entering in 2005. So that's the second wave of generation. But, and you can see the second wave coming because I think the first wave was catching the trend or catching the forecast or catching the uh, atmosphere that this com uh, country is going to grow. GDP wasn't growing that much back in the mid 90s, but certainly the companies were looking for some markets after China, whereas 2005, the second wave, they clearly saw this country is going to be booming. And that's why the second entrance was there. Mitsubishi only entered, re-entered, I should say, uh, into India around in after 2012, 13, 14, to be honest with you. Of course, Mitsubishi have been doing a lot of trading business. So we do waterborne trading of uh, machinery equipments to shrimps, to 
a lot of those um, 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 items. However, I'm talking about investing in uh, India, making India, and we have really not done much. Um, even we couldn't even enter India in the uh, 2005, six, six around that period of time. We had lots of tax issues uh, with the uh, Indian government, uh, and that, that really prompt, uh, demotivated us in really entering this country. So we're we're behind the second generation. So this is the first wave, and this is the second wave of Japanese company, but as for Mitsubishi, it's the third wave. And what I'm trying to say here is that, okay, Mitsubishi is rather late in coming here. We are still have a lot to learn, but the first wave or the second wave finally is accumulating 10, 20 years of experiences in India. And I think that is important uh, for going to the next slides. And again, don't read the, the you, you will not be able to read it, but the point I'm making here is I've listed from one to 20 of the success foreign, successful foreign companies. And you know that Maruti Suzuki, for instance, is the most successful in the listing companies, and they entered in 1981, and all this, I'm not going to go into details, but all I'm trying to say here is that the real success stories, um, the listing companies I have listed on the top, um, maybe it doesn't show, okay. But anyway, Hindustan Unilever, Bosch, uh, Ambuja Cement, Siemens, Nestle's, these are all 50-year-old, 60-year-old companies, and that's why they're, they're, I wouldn't say that's why, but they're on the top. Japanese companies or Korean companies who have spent 20 years are finally uh, coming to uh, a very um, recognizable profit margins. Whereas on the last row, for example, like Panasonic's or Yakurto or Kokuyo, uh, Kokuyo's, They've been here for about 10 years. Half of them are still in red. So my question is, why does it take so much time in India? Why does it take for a Japanese company to be successful? Why does it take so much time? In the past, and I, I, was, I was told when I was uh, leaving Japan, the T time of uh, 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 time to be spent, uh, or uh, sorry, the reason for not being able to succeed in India was largely due to lack of infrastructure and bureau bureaucracy in the government. That was really the two statements that I have at least heard back in the old days of the reason why the Japanese companies uh, were str uh, struggling to succeed. But now, the reasons that there was uh, questionnaires asked to each company, and there's uh, uh, several papers by the consultants, and they're analyzing this, and I think they're saying, what they're saying is that Japanese companies takes lots of time to invest, uh, investigate, lots of time to investigate, and when, the ac when they come in and for, uh, start doing the actual business, Oftentimes, the um, analysis from the investigation and actual whatever happens quite differs. It doesn't resemble what the investigations uh, resulted in. So no matter how much time or the money you spent, it was very difficult for Japanese companies to actually grasp what this country is. Why? I think my one year experience, when I talk to, let's say, I, when I ask the same question to five different Indian uh, uh, persons, I get five different answers. And I think this is the image of what I get, is um, this is a, a commercial by a, a map company called Zenrin, where you ask something and I get two different answers. Which means when I when Mitsubishi starts want to invest uh, investment or and investigate into India, you ask questions 
which generates more questions, and then you keep generating questions. And so you don't come to a real good comfort level of really trying to figure out what this is all about. And I think Japanese companies firstly hesitate in not having a clear answer, but the second point is that I think we just try to kind of close our eyes and let's just go with it to, to some extent. And I think there's a lot of time consumption in this uh, learning curve. So I guess point is maybe why don't we focus the investigation? Companies who have succeeded in India, Sony and Yuncharm is uh, some examples that I'm listing. And let's not get into details, but for example, as for Unicharm, they have many, many different products. Unicharm have many different products. They only selected baby diapers. So they just concentrated only on one segment. Sony. They have a lot of, uh, as you know, many, many different kinds of uh, appliances. They only concentrated on one single point, which is image or sound quality. That's the only area that they really focused. And I think that is paying off. The focusing of the investigation is, I think, paying off. So, key to success. If I'm Mitsubishi or if I'm a Japanese company and if I want to enter uh, India and, and if I'm going to ask the same question and I'm going to have 10 different answers, let's try to focus a little bit. And when I say focus, I'll give you one example. Let's regionally focus. So I'm going to talk about regional focusing. These are company names which Mitsubishi has joint ventures in other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, for instance, our biggest, biggest success story is in Thailand. Uh, we have a Isuzu joint venture, and it's a huge, huge success for us. For example, uh, with Mitsubishi Motors, we have a joint venture. Um, this is in uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, Mitsubishi Elevators, we have a joint venture in Vietnam. But these entrants of these, uh, these markets are all divided by countries. When we enter with Isuzu on Thailand, we don't investigate Korea or we don't investigate China. We investigate it deeply, deeply into Thailand. And that's the focusing. That, this, I'm just giving you some examples of focusing. So when we talk about India, what I learned is GDP, average per capita, $1,700. Literacy rate, 74%. Poverty, poverty rate, 20, 21%. So is this the real picture of India? I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, you, you probably know. But this is, this is whole India on average. And I don't think this really represents where, for instance, if I want to sell my elevators, or if I want to go to Isuzu uh, to market my Isuzu cars, I don't think I'm going to use these numbers to figure out what kind of marketing I should be doing. If, if the poverty uh, uh, literacy rate is 74%, I'm not going to put any uh, language, I'm going to put probably our uh, animation, Japanese animation manga or something for people to understand. So I think there's a big distinct difference in terms of focusing where you're going to um, market or where you're going to enter. And so focusing is probably going to be really what to focus is, of course, is a very difficult uh, point to um, um, decide. But I think that is something that we have to really, really, as of all Mitsubishi is concerned, have to really focus and narrow down to understand uh, part of India. And I think that's going to be the start for us. Just to give you an example of why we think that approach is correct is because 
as you know, this is a map of India, but there are all the um, ASEAN countries uh, from population point of view, or even from the GDP point of view, is inside of India. So when we discussed, let's say I want to go into uh, uh, establishing a Isuzu car and I succeeded in Thailand, why don't I just go to Rajasthan because it has the same population? <laughs> I mean, I don't have to look everywhere else. I mean, I think maybe that's part of the strategy. Even the cities itself is GDP in similar. For example, uh, let's pick, uh, let's say, Ho Chi Minh in uh, uh, Vietnam. GDP is nearly equal to Bangalore. So if we're going to do something in Ho Chi Minh, why don't we do the same in Bangalore to begin with? Let's not just go to Bangalore and Delhi and Chennai. And I think that's where I think our focus should be. So after narrowing the... Uh, the focused area or focus sectors. What's next? I'm talking, I'm going to talk about cultures. And this is something I think I can talk a little bit more positively um, because I think uh, Japanese companies have started to learn uh, about the cultures in India. Now, there's a lot of success stories for Mitsubishi within the Southeast Asian countries. Like I mentioned to you in Thailand and Vietnam, we have a lot of success stories there. And we have defined what the reasons are, and there's several reasons like respect for Japanese technologies or wanting to uh, incorporate the Japanese management system but I like to focus on the Japanese speaking stuff, local language speaking Japanese stuff. This, as we see, or at least I see when I see the success uh, uh, joint ventures we have in uh, those countries in Southeast Asia, there's lots of these Japanese speaking um, national stuff who is really uh, climbing up the ladder and uh, contributing to the success of the joint ventures. So, how does India uh, uh, stand to this? I know the numbers you cannot read, but I'll just read. Um, foreign students in Japan. Foreign students in Japan. By far, China sends the most students to Japan they, in 1916, uh, sorry, 2016, they have sent 107,000 students from China to Japan. 107,000. At the same time, India sent, do you know how many? 1,200. So it's 107,000 against 1,200. But even between those countries, there's a lot of countries who send in big chunks. Vietnam is number two in sending 60,000 students to Japan. 60,000 students. Nepal sends 21,000. I thought their population is lower than 21,000, but <laughs> they sent 21,000 students. In, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, these numbers means a lot, means a lot, because they not just speak the language, but they understand the cultures, and they spread the words, and they under comes uh, out, un uh, narrows down both sides of the cultures. And that's how I see the success, uh, key success, in the joint ventures within what Mitsubishi has in Southeast Asia. The other uh, chart represents foreign students studying in Japan. Foreign students studying in Japan. Once again, China is the biggest, um, no, no, sorry, sorry, this is no. Foreign students studying Japanese, just simply Japanese everywhere, anywhere in the world. So we have uh, 10, 15 uh, students today, all inclusive, yeah? China has 
953,000 people studying Japanese. 953,000. Second place is Indonesia, 745,000. South Korea, 550,000. Well, we go down the list. India, including these 15 students today, 24,000. 24,000 opposed to China's 953,000. But the amazing point is China, out of the same population as India, basically, one, China uh, has one student learning Japanese per every seven people in the population. Every seven, one, oh, Janaina, no, sorry, 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 one more day. Seven students per 10,000 uh, uh, people in China. Seven out of 10,000 is learning Japanese. Okay? India, 0 0.18 per 10,000. So you are very, very valuable. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and then, but all, all I'm trying to say is, okay, this is just a snapshot of 2016. But between China and India, of course, China is the top place and uh, India is in the 12th uh, ranking. A lot of the countries in between is where Mitsubishi is succeeding. The countries like uh, Australia, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, these are the countries where Mitsubishi is really succeeding in joint ventures and um, making production facilities. And I think this Japanese speaking uh, staffs, employees, um, does help, does help the bridge of the uh, cultural differences. And it's vice versa, of course. But I think this is one big uh, success stories uh, that we have learned from southeastern uh, countries, which would, we would certainly would like to apply into Indian, uh, India as a country as well. So last uh, message from this slide is, to be very honest with you, Everyone speaks uh, two languages at, at most of people, I think, in India, because you have the local language and you have the English. And I, I really admire that. Huh? Three? Yes. Hindi. 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 Three. And I feel that you don't feel the necessity of going to one more foreign language, because you have plenty of the capability of speaking different languages. But I think in order to go global, or at least to uh, uh, integrate with the global companies, that one more foreign language other than English would really, really go a long way. It doesn't have to be Japanese, yo. it could be anything uh, of your choice. But I think, because Jap in Japan, we, Japanese is the only uh, 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 only uh, people who only speaks Japanese. Eh? You know, there's no other countries that speaks Japanese. So we try English because that's the hardest we can go. But we think that English is okay, have to be a basis of our uh, battle within the uh, globalization. But within Japan, I think the second foreign language is more highly, um, I shouldn't say respected, but more valued um, although a lot of Japanese haven't been successful, including myself, um, I think the importance or the value of this one more foreign language, I think I would like India to kind of start incorporating because I think the uh, future for India is going to be uh, in par and again aligning with these global um, uh, companies and global uh, networks around the world. Okay, so uh, if uh, having said all this, these um, cultural differences, we say cultural differences, but particularly on the company culture. Of course, in the past, there was a lot of difference. Japanese loves trust and monocultural, but you have this jagad, 
which I'm still trying to learn. But, uh, but um, I like it actually. I mean, I, I like this concept, but it's a cultural difference, which we used to have a, we, which you, we used to feel a big, big gap between these two um, cultures. But as the business grows, I think this, uh, there's uh, something is starting to narrow down. The cultural difference is starting to narrow down. Japanese loves uh, lifetime employment uh, in the past, you know, I know, in the past, a little bit in the past, seniorities. And Japanese always tries to make generalists. I mean, that was the tendency when I joined the company. I think Indians uh, go for more specialist type of uh, uh, creating a co uh, company culture. And uh, of course, there's a lot of contract employments in this country. That still probably continues. But it is narrowing down because, and I'm not sure whether you agree to this or not, but the Japanese co company culture, company culture, for instance, the uh, terminology called work-life balance. I have heard this in India as well. I have started to hear about this work-life balance. Performance-based. This is starting to hear. And Japan has started to, well, maybe started a little bit long ago, but now it's finally fitting in. The self-decision or the professionalism, these things, I think there's going to be some kind of a um, narrowing down of these two company cultures. And the reason why is because we both have to fight with the uh, international global standards and global practices and global companies. So I think it's no brainer that we don't, maybe we don't uh, intentionally try to narrow it down, but we are narrowing it down. And I think we will be surprised when we start really thinking about it that maybe we're talking about uh, a same type of culture heading to the same type of directions. So this is what I had heard uh, in India. There's a movie called Three Idiots, which it was a long movie, so I fell asleep about one, one hour. And <laughs> I haven't seen the rest of the movie, but I heard this is a movie about Indian wants to do something deciding by yourself. And I think that's the similar culture where the Japanese young generation is going. I entered Mitsubishi without really thinking too much. I mean, just kind of entering and see what happens. But now, the, um, because my father was a salaryman, so I, I thought I would be the salaryman. And I didn't really think too much hard about it. But I think there's a lot of younger generation in Japan, which is similar to these three idiots thinking what they really want to do by themselves. So there's start, uh, entrepreneurs are starting to born in Japan as well. So if the company cultures are narrowing, I think the cultures should blend well in the future. So what's left? There's this, like I said, blending cultures means there's some similarities. Uh, I think, I think, Indian companies are high, uh, here, here, uh, how do you pronounce it? Uh, hierarchy, here, here. Oh. Hierarchy, hierarchy, hierarchical. You know, relationship with the boss is very, where I see it, it's very formal. I mean, I don't see them just going together and having a drink or something. I don't see that. Um, Relationship with subordinates is not as close, but it's there's a some formal uh, relation to to uh, relation to it, and I think that's similar to Japan. Sense of ownership of work, um, I was very surprised. Uh, I, know, I I thought before coming to India, everyone leaves at 5:30. No one, I mean, at least my company, no one leaves. No Indian leaves at 5.30. And this is really, really a good surprise for me. I mean, I, I'm not trying to see it. we're a black company, but they, they work until they finish the job. That's how I, uh, I'm taking this. I don't like this part, conservativeness at meetings. You know, 
I thought Indians would raise hands and just shoot out questions and opinions, but I, at least in my company, I don't see it too much happening. And I'm not sure in the rest of the companies, but in Japanese companies, this is very similar. I mean, in Mitsubishi, more, it's so conservative. I know, well, my, I should not say this in front of the camera, but uh, <laughs> anyway, all I'm saying is that this is, these are the similarities, the silos. The Japanese companies love verticals, the silos. And I think Indian companies does operate, some companies operate in that way. And I, I think there's similarities. Okay, but it is changing. The difference, let's say, quick answers to slow decisions. Mitsubishi makes, we are very confident in making slow decisions. <laughs> but once we make decisions, we keep promises. But that's our confidence. Quick answers for Indians. You know, you ask some question, instantly you get an answer. And it's amazing how confident they answer to you. And I haven't proved whether they were right or wrong, but <laughs> it, this, is, this, is, this is very, very, um, I think it's important to show your confidence uh, to fight against, you know, uh, global cultures. I think this is very, very um, um, important um, factors, but let's be more precise if we can. And all these things are still differences. There's no cultures which cannot, uh, which going to be identical, right? So these are differences that I think we can overtake. So what I'm, sa what I'm saying to here is that company cultures, because the world is changing, because we have the internet, because we have such a communication network, I think then because we have to fight against the global uh, companies, our company cultures is going to slowly, slowly narrow down the differences. It's not going to be the same but the differences are narrowing. So what's left? I think it's the mindset, the mindset. Well, I'm not sure whether you have seen this picture before, but um, this is uh, pro uh, probably, not probably, but this is, uh, uh, the question is, you were, to told, you were told to put green on the circle and red on the square. And probably the mindset difference is the left-hand side is what the result from the Indians would do in one day, whereas the right-hand side is the result of how Japanese do it in one week. And I think this is, this is but we are laughing at about it, but I think we have to rec start recognizing that maybe this is not correct now. I think it's this mindset that keeps us telling us that, okay, Indians are always like this, and the Japanese is always like this. But I think it's changing, because I know my daughter would write like my, uh, on the left-hand side. And so there's no question that things are changing. And I think it's the mindset that is really preventing a lot of things to still change. So let me, uh, I have only three more slides. Let me just give you one, uh, two slides of the image, or sorry, the mindset, what the mindset change can bring. As seen from the pictures, you can tell that we're talking about food. And uh, the uh, hor uh, vertical line is the freshness, and the uh, horizontal line is the days, number of the days. So when the potato starts after being harvested. Obviously, the, if the days are short, the freshness is there. What I'm trying to get at is, as the days progresses, the freshness starts to deteriorate, and you start losing taste, you start losing textures. But okay, I think you, you can be satisfied if the price is cheaper. I think in Japan, we have this mindset that we want this to look as nice as possible and it has to be wrapped and look so fresh that this is, but this is still a mindset issue because more days you come, the nutrition loss is starting to happen and the moisture loss is going to start happening. 
And what this brings you to is food loss. And food loss means you're just wasting. You're just dumping this. And dumping means, of course, food loss is a result of the oxidation of the bacteria. But food loss is something you can prevent if your mindset is starting to change. I think Japan started to change its mindset because, of course, Japan in the earlier days didn't care about the nutrition or the moisture but did care about the food loss. Uh, Japanese have a word called motainai, which means we don't want to waste things. And I think that created this mindset that, okay, let's not dump things, then let's start utilizing things, or then let's start making things more fresh, more neat, more clean. So it's a backward integration from this mindset of this um, uh, food loss. So I'm hoping that there's going to be a sense of this freshness is going to be a value for India. Um, it's not something as um, uh, you're being taught, but it's like uh, you feel that this is going to be starting to be a value because you don't want to waste food or because maybe you don't want to uh, uh, eat something unhealthy and uh, go into hospitals. Let's not just look at the price, but let's look at the texture. Let's look at the moisture. And I think these are the things which is going to start changing. And the reason why I'm saying this is because Mitsubishi is in the cold chain logistics system. Uh, we do the cold chain business in India. And um, usually, if the mindset of the consumers want fresh food, then the whole value chain covers from the farm to the consumers. But in India, the cold chain really covers the middle part, the, the food processing part, largely. I wouldn't say zero, but largely the uh, pro agri products or whatever the products are brought into the warehouse and then the food processing starts and that's where the uh, cold chain starts. And the cold chain ends at the retails, but it doesn't go into the final consumer so occasionally. I'm just trying to say as an example. And I think the mindset changes these things. Mindset of, okay, let's not dump food or let's eat some healthy food. That's the change in the mindset of the consumer which backward integrates and making sure that the cold chain logistics covers from the farm produce all the way into consumers. And this is where I think the Japanese companies can really contribute by giving technologies of uh, cold chain logistics or networking, um, IT, AI, kind of uh, technologies. I think that's where the Indian companies and uh, Japanese companies starts to uh, blend well. And so it's all about this. Okay, friends, uh, we'll end up on uh, our time. And uh, thank you very much. Rajiva, would you like to say something? something? Please, he will have the last word, a vote of thanks, Mr. Rajiv Mehta. But friends, before he does that, why would we not all stand up to give a warm round of applause to him? This has been an amazingly wonderful evening. What a pleasure it was. Sir, you have come in all the heat. Now you'll have to come in the good weather times as well. Please, Rajivai. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation uh, about the uh, tips in India. I, I'll uh, use your last line uh, of three idiots. Uh, what we are doing, our tactic is to uh, create a culture uh, uh, which is pro-Japanese. And uh, if you see the mindset and if you see the figures, uh, you presented that in 2016, uh, there were 1,230 six students who are learning Japanese and we are proud to mention that 500 plus students have learned Japanese from AMA and through uh, your support 
uh, in uh, the uh, Japan study circle. So this is what we have done and we are creating this culture and uh, we are moving towards the trend. So it is very good that you came and motivated us further. Uh, I am really thankful for that. And uh, uh, I look forward to have many more interactions and involvements uh, uh, in uh, creating the uh, culture and the mindset, uh, especially in Gujarat. And as you said, the same strategy we are following, uh, uh, it is the regional. And so we are Ahmedabad Management Association. So if you see percentage in Ahmedabad about the uh, uh, knowledge and uh, opinion and also interest in Japan, you see the numbers here. And uh, we are very happy for that. I thank all of you to be here uh, together with us today uh, uh, to have this wonderful session. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I thank all the people here. Thanks.